Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Sam Priestley, and as normal, I'm joined by my lovely wife, Emma. Hello! Emma, today I wanted to talk about business opportunities that I think exist right now, and that will be, like, 2019 is the prime time to do them. Sounds good. You may remember in my New Year's resolutions, one of them was to start a new business. It is, yes. So these are the ones that I've been thinking about. Oh, um, oh, this is exciting. I've been waiting for this. Yeah, so hopefully you'll like one or more than them. Ooh. Give me your opinions. And if we don't end up doing any of them, then maybe someone who's listening will, will like one of your ideas and it will inspire them. Sounds good. All right, well, let's start off with probably the one that I've spoken to you about before the most, I've been thinking about for a few years, which is uh, sort of flipping online businesses. Basically, online businesses, especially e-commerce businesses, are very undervalued at the moment. So you can buy a brand that sells pretty much only on online, on Amazon, or on their own website for about two to three times a day is yearly profit. Now, if you sell a brand, so for instance, our gym brand, if we were to sell that to an established drink company, we'd probably get about 10 times the yep. profit. Now, the difference between some of these online businesses and a traditional offline business isn't as big as people think. No. They're actually quite similar. and They're just different mediums. Well, it's um, the same product. It's the same pro- product, exactly. Or so, service. So I think there is a real opportunity to buy these, buy like a portfolio of these online businesses, hopefully make a few improvements, try and shift them a bit more to be attractive to offline buyers or traditional investment companies, and then sell them on. Yep. I mean, in some ways, it's quite low risk because even if the business, you don't manage to sell it on offline. You, you still can, make your money off it. You'll still make money off it and you can then sell it on for basically what you bought it. Yeah. Like the prices aren't going to get cheaper. Yeah. For those sort of online businesses. Yeah, well, not anytime offensive. soon. The risk, though, is fraud. And I yes. think that's why they're so cheap at the moment is that people don't really understand how do you... How do you do any due diligence on an online business? Which you know very uh, how to do quite clearly. Well, no, I know more than most people. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Especially on Amazon. On Amazon, yeah. But then how how do you differentiate between real and fake customers? Like you can spend a bit of money to inflate your numbers, inflate your traffic, inflate your sales to make the business look appealing. Well, I suppose um, if you, if this is something that you, you did this year and say you, you invested in five businesses to start with, there probably will be some of that and you'll learn how to spot it. But it's not really something you can find the answer to before you start business, I think. Yes, I agree with you. I think it's one of these businesses that I would want to go in quite hard on. Yes. So I would want to maybe look at doing five to ten maybe 10 within the first year. Yeah. Um, putting quite a bit of money or raise a bit of money for it. Maybe build a little team who can focus on different parts of improving these businesses. Yeah, like a remote team. A remote team or a local team or some freelancers who I know are good at this sort of stuff. Yep. Because I'm sure there's a lot of low-hanging fruit with these businesses. So ways that I can maybe add like an easy 20 to 30% on their profit without much work which kind of overnight would earn the money back and at least cover a lot of the upfront costs. And then even if I end up not really being able to sell them and I end up with an income generator that's earning me 20% a year, yeah. whatever it is. Well, then that's a good thing. That's amazing. It's more than that, 50% a year. What a ridiculous t- return on investment. Well, yeah. Um, and it's interesting as well because even find, I can imagine finding some potential companies that are looking to sell you could probably do some marketing on your blog i reckon there's loads of listeners and readers out there that might be interested in you buying their business uh there might be i think it's more likely the other way around that there'll be people on my blog who are looking to um invest i think there'll be both there, there might well be both yeah yeah well there's quite a lot of marketplaces now there's uh, empire flippers flipper.com there's a few different ones what the ridiculous titles yeah i know they haven't done very well to make Empire themselves flippers. yeah and they're actually a really good business wow. they've done really well but i do think they're a little bit handicapped by their name yeah it doesn't sound like a premium broker it sounds dodgy 
it does sound a bit dodgy, but they're they're selling businesses that have valuations of over a million pounds. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, they're kind of the well known one. But even if you go on their website and you get in two to three years valuations, it's really low, especially when it's a it's a brand. It'll own all the trademarks. It'll have its own website. It'll have a bunch of stock probably as well. Yeah. So, what do you think are some of the areas that you'll be able to improve these online businesses? Like, what types of freelancers, like in terms of skills, do you think you could pull together? And I imagine that some of them will be very good at one type of online marketing. Yeah. So, they're on Amazon, they'll be very good at getting sales for Amazon. So, yeah. they'll have the Amazon adverts nailed down. They'll have the keywords, all that kind of stuff. Something I'd be quite good at then is maybe trying to find other avenues, other ways to drive traffic. Maybe be on the SEO side, building their own website. Maybe finding uh, wholesalers we could sell to and try and bring the bring the business local. Yep. What about the like supply chain? And I might be able to do some stuff on the supply chain. In terms of cutting costs, I might costs. not. I don't know. That the problem is is that when you're buying stuff quite cheaply, which these businesses are, even if you can save. 20% or something it doesn't add that much to your profit yeah it'd be much better to increase the sales than to reduce the overheads yeah so that's the first that sounds really good idea yeah that's quite that's one I've been thinking about for a while and also I think it really taps into your constantly wanting to do something new I think the idea of all these different businesses that you can be thinking about all the time um and the the opportunity to keep buying new ones I think really um would be really good for you because you like you like new product new projects yeah you yeah. get really bored really quickly and there's there's other interesting things i could do like i could build a portfolio of businesses that are complementary towards each yeah, other yeah and connect them so i could buy an affiliate site to do with something i could buy a brand that's selling the sort of things the affiliate site is promoting i could buy a little uh, software as a service doing something or other, all kind of linked and then you help promote that. them. Yeah. yeah. And then kind of the SEO, then waterfalls between a lot of these businesses, yeah. which could work quite well. So that is something I'm very interested in. The only downside is, as we said, I would want to invest quite a bit of money into it. And it's not a very lazy business. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the sort of one which I think will take, it'll be quite a steep learning curve to getting it right. I think it's a great opportunity right now. And it's also not very you in terms of investing quite a lot of money up front. There's, you, you, there's like, that. you like to invest a little bit to start with. I like to bootstrap. I like yeah. to test the water. And it's, you can't really do that with this, can you? No. You can't just buy one and have a trial. No. Well, you could, but it's not really... It's not the best way to do it. No. The other thing about this type of business is the way to get the best return i think is to have a lot of connections with uh, investment firms and stuff who i know would buy these businesses yeah which you don't at the moment which i don't so but that is something you can work on it is something to work on but it's not very me no it's not, it's not very going me. to networking events dressing up in a suit yeah schmo- schmoozing schmoozing talking to lawyers face to face getting introductions all that kind of stuff yeah be a lot of traveling up to london and meeting people you know san francisco or wherever maybe it's something we do when we get back from traveling maybe the problem is i think i'm not sure how long this opportunity is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really big arbitrage and i'm not sure how long it's going to be there for yeah so i think 2019 is the time to do it all right let's move on so that was the first idea my next idea is more of a product-based thing. The way we're buying stuff has, is changing, has changed, especially here in the UK. We're looking for sustainability. We want ethically sourced. We don't want much plastic. We want to support local businesses. So I think there is quite a big gap in the market from to do the opposite of what a lot of, a lot of other like Amazon-style businesses are doing, which is instead of buying cheap products from China buy stuff locally and then build that as part of the brand yep i think there's quite a few advantages you can do there uh, so for instance with food and drink it actually makes more sense to do it locally than to import because yep. it's an absolute nightmare but also in terms of time to market if you're making lots of changes to things having prototypes sent back and forth takes forever so i think that's quite a big big market we're kind of doing that a little bit with our gin at the moment yep. 
I think other well, food we're seeing the demand for it. With we're the seeing gin. the demand for it, and it's it's the trend is what it seems our friends are doing. They want to buy stuff that they kind of know where it's from. They don't want to support sweatshops. They don't want to yep. have too much plastic. They don't want the environmental consequence of their goods being flown all over the world. When it can be made around the corner. It can be made around the corner. And they can pay a bit more for it. And they can pay a bit more for it. I think that's true. I also think it's true for fashion. I think we're seeing a little shift now of uh, locally made fashion again. So that could be quite interesting. But that's not the area I'm mainly thinking about. I'm thinking about toys. Mm -hmm. I think toys could be really good. So many toys are excess plastic. I remember like at Christmas we were with my cousin... And her daughter was getting so many toys. You see, she was almost like cringing inside. She was very careful about not using straws or whatever. But when it came to the toys for a kid, people are buying her all sorts of stuff. Plastic. Yeah. Plastic plastic. wrapped in plastic. Plastic wrapped in plastic. Exactly. So I think there's a market there. I mean, the toy industry is very much targeted at kids. I think there is probably room to build a brand that's targeted at the parents instead. And focusing on that ethically local source stuff. And I think it'd be quite fun. And what's more fun than making toys? Mm. So I'm quite up for doing a bit of that. Yeah. Maybe it appeals to your silly side. It appeals to my silly side. I would like to do something to do with a patent. I want to invent something and then have some patent protection on it. Because it's that's something I've never done before. That's interesting. And I could probably do that in the toy industry. Basically invent a new toy. So that's kind of tickling my interest. And I think there's also potential for that to be quite a big brand. Next up, I think there's a, a demand for an Amazon FBA style business in distribution, in retail distribution. So Amazon FBA is a logistical network of warehouses run by Amazon where they charge you to store your stuff in them. So for instance, with my table tennis business, we'll send in 600 table tennis bats, we'll then pay a monthly fee. And then if someone buys something on Amazon, Amazon will deliver it from that warehouse and I'll get charged like a delivery fee. Classic distribution works kind of the other way around where the distributor will buy from you in bulk. Then they'll have a warehouse and they'll have very high cash flow problems because they're having to pay for all these random goods that are sitting around and it really matters to them if stuff doesn't sell. They've got to be very careful about what they buy when they take on new suppliers. So we found it particularly difficult to get in with alcohol distributors so they're saying we don't want another gin. Yep. But that's ridiculous. So for one of them, we got letters of intent from 10 different bars who use them saying we will buy this gin if, if, you, stock if it. you stock it. And that still wasn't good enough for them. That's And that they're missing out on such a big market, especially if I'm right about the trend going. Local. Smaller, local, premium brands, artisan, handmade, craft. So I think they're is a good market for that. Food and drink, yeah, that's one of them. I also think um, shops as well. So little retail stores getting a bit more boutique. So to have a kind of Etsy style distribution list that they can look at, you go into a little boutique toy shop or whatever, and you say, oh, well, we've got all these um, small, small brands. Instead of having to buy, I don't want to name any names here, but one of the big toy makers. Yeah. I think that could work quite well. And it saves the business the hassle of having to go out and deal with a lot of different little suppliers themselves. We definitely found that bars were very happy to spend more money to buy through a easier distributor and just add it to their weekly order than to buy from us directly. Definitely. It's all so about think, convenience. So I think that's a really good a really good market. And I think that it wouldn't be too difficult to give it a go. So the way I'd do it is I'd choose like a little industry, maybe maybe food or drink, maybe alcohol, since we're already doing it. I'd then find a bunch of small producers, all who had the same problem as us, and then go and find a few bars to sign up and then just build it from there. I think that could be done quite organically because it'd be quite easy to get a yes from the small brands because they're really struggling. <laughs> and there's so many little brands out there at the moment all doing really interesting stuff. Well, this is something I could set up today. Like, Yeah, I mean, we know a lot of <laughs> I them. I know a lot of the contacts, yeah. And we, and we have good relationships with loads of bars and stuff like that. Yeah, locally. Um, especially with food and drink, 
dish, like delivering your goods to people is a real pain and you really need large order sizes. And the way to do that is for people to mix and match from different brands. One bar won't want to buy six bottles of gin or fuss because it's a premium gin. They get through one bottle a week. They don't want to spend uh, six weeks worth up front. Yes. They'd rather buy two and then get another two in, yep. in two weeks time. Whereas if there was like four or five different small brands that they were specifically local, um, uh, sourced ethically, all that kind of stuff, I think they'd be really interested. Mm-hmm. That's something I was thinking, especially the problem is we're, we're thinking of going traveling again. If we were hanging around Tunbridge Wells, I think that would definitely be a, a really good business yeah. that I'd want to push. And again, it's the sort of thing that could be really big. It's a proven business model in um, direct consumer can we make it a proven business model in uh, business to business? Yes. The next one I was thinking was an Airbnb, but for shop fronts. So the idea yeah. would be that you would rent a shop front for a few days just to trial your product or for a week. I don't know why this doesn't exist. It doesn't. And there's been a few people who have tried it. Yeah, so someone locally. like Box Park, they, that was their idea. But I think they just did, they just balanced it all wrong the shop fronts weren't really set up so everyone had a really expensive cost of of setting up in there box park is a is a, a retail is a retail outlet where it's a bunch of shipping containers yeah. and their initial business model was that small brands would get it on a free month basis to do a pop-up for their thing. yeah so rotating shops for the customers and that didn't really work out for them, and they've gone to long-term tenants now. Yeah, and they're all big brands. They're all big brands. I think three months is too long. You want a few days to a week. I think that a lot of brands, especially online businesses, want a foothold in local, and that's something they can do. Especially brands who are trying to make themselves look more legitimate than they are. Mm. Having pictures of shop fronts and customers and all that kind of stuff is very important. Very. I think that there is real diminishing returns for being in one place for too long. Let's say I make premium high-end yoga gear. I could be on, say, the high street here in Tunbridge Wells for two weeks and pretty much everyone in Tunbridge Wells will hear about it and come and visit it. Yes. And quite a few will buy. And then Six months in, that. no one will ever come back in again. Yeah, definitely. So for those sort of businesses, it's a lot more value for them to be dotting around the place and yep. moving, moving town every few few weeks or whatever paying a premium on the rent for that short term but in order to just get in front of physically in front of just a lot more people yeah so how would i do that i think without investing a lot of money and doing it like a proper silicon valley startup the way to do it would be to find a few landlords who are struggling to rent their place yeah and then um sort of coming uh, approaching brands directly with this idea Mm. Someone else who I think would be interested in that are small artists. So currently, artists who want to get in with a gallery will have to get approved by a gallery. A gallery will have to kind of come to them and take a big cut. Yeah. Whereas I think what artists could do if they had this option is is open a gallery essentially for a week, display all their art that they spent the last year working on and try and sell it. Yeah. And they get to keep pretty much all the profits. I think that's not a good, good market. Anyway, there's loads of businesses I think this would be great for. And I think it wouldn't be hard to find businesses who are up for trying it. Yeah. I think the difficulty would be in finding... um, The relationships with the landlords. The relationships with the landlords. But I think we could do it. I think that would be another interesting one to do. Well, we already know the people that do that for the Pantars. We know people do it for the Pantars. We know the people that look after the um, big um, shopping centre here in Tumbridge Wells. Yeah, yeah. And that's just in here. So somewhere like around here, everything's quite expensive. It's yes. still, the high street is booming here. I think this is, could also work well in places where the high street isn't booming yeah. as much. We've recently watched the Hotel Chocolat documentary. Yeah. And they're opening stores in places where the rent is dirt cheap. Yeah, in the north. Where people don't have much money. But there yeah. still is a demand for really premium chocolate. Yes. Even though the people themselves don't have much disposable income. Yeah. I think those sort of places being there for a few days or a few weeks would work quite well. Mm. 
yeah, that's something that quite excites me. And like, I'd be signing up if there was one already around. Yeah, definitely. We would have used it for like, the gin, yeah, and probably I would have done it for supper clubs. And you, could probably, have done for you would have done it for the table tennis bats. We could have done it for like a workspace when thinking about doing yeah. some co-working. I've got loads of ideas for experimental style cafes and shops and stuff like that, which I'd like to trial without having to sign up for a five-year lease. Yeah, and you are happy to pay a little premium for that. I think for product launches, it'd be great. We're releasing a new flavour. Having a shop front for a few days for that would yeah. be great. I think for um, bigger businesses, even people like PwC and professional services, that works quite well. You have like a drop-in centre for people. Yeah, I There's think... Loads um, of things. Or I really like... Or or whatever. I like the idea that it's um, a pop-up for particularly these online businesses. Mm. So it's not just about... Right, we're going to make X number of sales in this week in Tunbridge Wells. It's about we're building this awareness, mm. and these customers will buy this product physically from us today, and then hopefully, when they run out of that product, they'll buy it online. Yeah. I think that relationship is really good, and being out and for those customers to be able to find out about your product and speak to the owners of the business mm. that are obviously really passionate about it, um, and that you'll remember that, and you'll want to buy more. Yeah, especially if you're doing something like shampoo. Like <laughs> yeah. Who buys shampoo from a random brand online? You might do, because you might have read a good review about it. Much better would be able to go, try it out, and then be a customer forever. Yeah. That. Yeah, because the barrier to entry for uh, physical business online is pretty much zero. Yeah. With Amazon FBA, which we've been talking about, oh, yeah. you can have your own warehouse, you can do next day delivery. Yeah all for almost no money but it isn't really the barrier to entry to having a retail location is still very high and this would be a way to get around it mm -hmm. I mean they could have all the licenses sorted so you wouldn't need to bother about it all the insurance alcohol licenses health and safety all that kind of stuff already done for you I think that'd be really good so those are the ones I'm thinking about for me uh, there's a few other areas I think there is a lot of opportunity in right now and probably the main one, so I think there's a lot of room for new style agencies or publicists or SEO firms that are targeted at these new style personal brands. So what do I mean by that? I mean people like Instagram influencers. So you'll have agents who work with singers and do all their promotion for them, getting them booked on TV, all that kind of stuff. But you don't have that for someone who uh, runs a course on how to learn table tennis or whatever. Yeah, well, they, they, there are people that exist like that, but they're just very few and far between and they're not necessarily good. Yeah, few and far between. And there isn't really any SEO agencies that I've come across doing that. Because you want one. Because I want one. I've been looking for one. And I've been looking for a publicist as well. Um, so I think that's a, a big opportunity. I also think that that is true not just for people like Instagram influencers, but also for professionals so let's say you are a lawyer and you really want to get partner and you want to build your brand you're earning £120,000 a year I think there's a lot of people like that who'd be willing to invest 20000 a year say on building an online presence for them in order to increase their chance of getting that partner because it's like anything isn't it if if the business you work for feels like they're getting something out of you they're more likely to hire you. Mm -hmm. If you've got this online presence, you're well known for certain search terms to do a law, you've got relationships with potential clients, they're going to pick you rather than your competitor who's mm -hmm. just busy head down working in the business. Same people in finance. A lot of city businesses, I think, city companies, I think it's worthwhile people who are on a real career path and want to become a high flyer to invest in their own personal branding and yeah. potentially hire an agent or a publicist to do help that. Help them to do that, yeah. Yeah, or a social media manager, something like that. So I think all that kind of stuff has got a bit of um, bit of opportunity. And I think it's, it's mainly 2019, I think, is the time to do it because mm, there's no one really doing it. If it gets to the point that everybody who is trying to get partner at the law firm has their own little uh, PR agency, then it, it loses its value. But when you're the only one, that's worth quite a lot. Mm. So I think that'd be another good one. There's a few other professional services, I think, like that, that it's could be good. Accounting. And accounting's a classic one. Accounting for online uh, physical product businesses, 
Amazon businesses, stuff like that. There's not really many people who, who are good at that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Same for lawyers, kind of the idea of, you know, GDRP and like how, what you're allowed to put on, what do you have to declare, when you have to pay VAT, uh, what are your the patent, liability. The patent stuff and competitors patent stuff, copying yeah. your, or where are your legal rights and yeah. Again, all the stuff that you've, uh, that have challenged you and you've been looking for people to, professionals to help you. Yeah, and who don't charge an absolute fortune. And, because the problem is, is when you go to a lawyer and you say, I'm trying to get someone who's copying my product on Amazon kicked off. Yeah. They're, they're like, like, oh, well, I've never done that before, but I know a bit about trademark and all this kind of stuff. But they don't know anything about the specific issue. Well, so you're paying them to work it out. Yeah, which And you're paying not... them a lot of money. You're paying, whatever, a partner, 500, 600 pounds an hour. Yeah to do that for you you want someone who is an expert in all these kind of online and all the intellectual property stuff that goes along with it yep. which is a big thing at the moment like instagram what can you get away with resharing or retagging all this kind of stuff yep. and how do you how do you help protect what you've created yeah who who's ultimately who owns the product or the image or the marketing yeah mm. And yeah, what rights do you have over it? Yeah, and how do you protect it? There's a problem at the moment on YouTube where if you create a video and someone files a copyright infringement against it, they'll just take down the video. And there's this process to get it back put up, which could, which can lead to you getting your account closed. Wow. And the idea is that if you keep going, you eventually have to go to court and it's kind of who blinks first. If you drop out before the other person drops out, it goes as a worse and worse strike on your YouTube account. You can have it deleted. So what companies are doing is that if someone posts something really critical about them, they'll just put a copyright infringement on it. That's awful. And YouTube have decided that they're not going to play adjudicator. They're going to remove it until you go to court and the court decides. Wow. And there's like three or four steps before you get to court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if either one blinks first, it's gone. But if both of you are happy, and some of these companies have got such huge legal departments, they don't mind it's wasting so uneth- a bit of money on that. It's so unethical. It's so unethical, yeah. It's all about now, isn't it? Yeah. That if you can stop something being on YouTube for a few weeks... It's worth your time. That's, that's worth you spending. Yeah. That, for your brand, However that could much be worth you lawyers. spending yeah. quite a few thousand on that. Yeah. And the consequences are very one-sided because... You could push this, delay it for a few weeks, and then blink, and the guy will get it re-uploaded, mm-hmm. and it won't cost you effing, because you don't need to go to court. You can just stop at that point. Yeah. Whereas with them, if they blink first, if they oppose it, and then push it, and then blink first, they could lose their whole YouTube account. Which like, is worth a huge amount of money to them. <laughs> yeah, well, some of these people, income. this is their livelihood. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and I think we're just touching the surface yeah. of that kind of stuff. And especially on the international side, with um, e-commerce, it's a big issue with fakes and people copying it because a lot of them won't be based in the same country as you. So the traditional ways of enforcing that kind of stuff doesn't really work anymore. Yeah. So there's definitely room for professional services that are aimed at smaller businesses. Well, they're not necessarily smaller businesses, but they're more like one-man band businesses who've got these big... Um, empires whether that be a content empire like a youtube creator or a physical product create um, empire like us with our table tennis equipment being everywhere in the world and still just run from here in this flat yeah the other business opportunity that we haven't spoken about that i think is quite highly likely that i might do is back on the gambling stuff yeah listener if you do not know i used to be a professional gambler and I made money from a bunch of different things, things like match betting, which is taking advantages of sign-up bonuses, arbitrage, which is hedging your bets um, and locking in a profit, basically finding bookies that are slower. But one area that I tried to get into and never really succeeded, and it still still bugs me a little bit that I never made it work, is on trading and basically writing kind of algorithmic trading bots that can sort of monitor market patterns and look for opportunities and do a bit of AI type stuff. Yep. 
kind of take a lot of the stuff that worked on the financial markets and translate it over to the much more immature betting markets. Previously, I spent quite a bit of time and money on this sort of stuff and it never made it work. And that still bugs me. And I think the opportunity is still there. So what do you need to do that? Do you need a development team? No, no, I just need to spend the time on it. Can you do it all um, yourself? Uh, probably, yeah. Do you want to do it all by yourself? Probably. <laughs> um, well, I'm not saying <laughs> I've got an answer for you. I just, yeah, I'm interested to see. It, it's one of those things that might never work. So therefore, if you do it on your own, then it's just your time you've lost. Well, and the money you spend on it. Because bear in mind, you're betting with money. Yeah. And so that's definitely something you could do when we're travelling. Yes. Quite yes. easily in the workspace, in the co-working spaces. Uh, maybe. Yeah. It depends on a few things. Such as... A lot of countries don't allow gambling. It's illegal. Oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. Is so, there a long list of those countries? Yeah. Yeah, it's most countries. Don't allow online gambling. Especially like in Asia and places like that. Wow. Um, any kind of Muslim country won't allow it. Wow. Even the USA doesn't really allow it. So it's Europe, you can? Not even like, you're not allowed in France. There's a bunch of other countries. Wow. There's a lot of countries you can't. It's not something I'd ever thought about. Yeah. So it's then how would I do that? Um, do I then tunnel the IP address through the UK? Or... Yep. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is all a moot point that's just the logistics of yeah. how it actually was done but it could be done it is something I'd like to do and it is quite likely that I might look into that there we go there are some of the ideas I've got for 2019 what do people think what do people think what do you think what, what any of them jump out at you well they all sound really good yeah that's kind of the problem <laughs> I mean obviously the first one is the most exciting and I think it, it um you suit it mm. very well. It's quite ambitious. Uh, it's high stakes. You'd learn a lot from it. Uh, I like the the idea of you building a, a team of freelancers and um, getting involved in lots of different types of businesses that you don't know much about. And I think it plays to your skill set. Mm. The only issue is the easiest way to lose a lot of money is to invest in a business that goes wrong. <laughs> Start. And so there is the risk, you know, of putting too much into it and then losing a lot of what have we've already have. Yeah. Um, and as I said, it's quite unlike you to want to spend a lot of money on a new business because mm. you're, yeah, you like to bootstrap. Mm. So it's quite out of your comfort zone, quite risky. I think that appeals to you. It does appeal to me. I'm a bit self-destructive, so I like betting everything on red. <laughs> I feel like you'd just say, well, I would just do a bit of online gambling and get it back. Oh, that's the problem, right? We're still young. What's the harm of starting again from scratch? Well, yeah. Is this a case of life is so comfortable that we need to... <laughs> risk it all. We need to risk it all in order to, <laughs> to keep, the, keep the fire alive. <laughs> oh. Keep life worth living. No, that sounds very stressful. Um, it does, isn't it? I really like the principle of the professional services. Mm. Um, I like the idea of you kind of recruiting people um, and helping to set them up. Because obviously you'd need to partner with lawyers and accountants and blah, blah, blah. It's not about you training in these yeah. areas. You helping individuals to market themselves and basically help with their strategy and their business plan. And then connecting these people with customers. I think I think that you'd be really good at it. These resources you could then use I for your use businesses. Myself. Yeah. I, I like that idea a lot. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the problem with those sort of businesses is I, I feel like I need better way in. I'm kind of so out of professional, professional services. services. And I've never been in professional services. But I just, I don't know... The people, I don't know the culture. I don't, I don't really know what I'm up against. Whereas a lot of the other ones, I can see the route to market. I can think, I can think of like the A to D steps I would take to get there. Whereas with this one, I've both got to find the customers and I've got to find the people to do the job. And I'm not entirely sure where to start with either. Yeah, and I think the fact that you don't know the answers is an incentive to do the business not a blocker yeah i think 
that it's a real advantage that you don't know how slow and bureaucratic professional service industry is. I think you coming in with a completely new approach is a positive. Yeah, potentially, potentially. I should talk to my lawyer about it. (laughs) And I know a lot about professional services. Yeah, you can wait to get out. (laughs) I spent my whole time there learning about the politics and the structure because it absolutely fascinated me. Mm. I spent all my time meeting with people for coffee Mm. and finding out what they did, what what the politics was, where their issues were, because it it just completely baffled me. Mm. Well, there we have it. Seven business ideas that I think are really good opportunities in 2019. Let's run through them really quickly. The first one was flipping online businesses. I think the opportunity is to buy a business that is selling as an online business, rebrand it as a local or a traditional style business and sell it on. Secondly, I think that if you're creating a product brace based brand there's a big opportunity to look into local sourcing sustainable ethical all that kind of stuff do the opposite of what everyone else is doing which is buying cheaply from china and instead buy local next up was i think there's a big market for an amazon fba style company but in retail distribution so such as an alcohol distributor Next up was an Airbnb for shopfronts, so somewhere where you could rent a shopfront for a few days, either for your kind of online brand or a traditional style business if you wanted just to move around a lot, or if you wanted to just try out an idea. I think there's a big area at the moment for traditional agencies or PR companies or SEO people to focus on individuals rather than say celebrities so city folk lawyers and stuff like that to help them build their own personal brand online as well as of course online entrepreneurs and people people like me who've got a little instagram presence and are trying to build our personal brands and i also think there's room for other types of professional services such as lawyers and accountants people like that for these kind of new style one-man band uh, online businesses whether those are content creators such as youtubers or sort of mini empires mini international empires of product businesses like our table tennis business which is sold in many different countries but it's still just only a few of us involved in it and then the final one which is a bit of wild card was i still think there's opportunity in trading on the betting markets didn't really talk too much about that because it's a bit random and it's a bit more specific to me all right well thanks for sitting with me and listening to my ramblings that's very interesting mm. been waiting for this list for a while mm. and listener if you have any questions or you feel like giving these a go or if you know of any businesses who are already doing these things then please get in touch you can reach me at hello at samprecy.com i'll put the show notes where i'll write a little bit more about the different things on my blog, that's samprecy.com. Apart from that, goodbye. Bye.